Jesus high. Jesus healing the guy's ear. Remember when they went to arrest him? And uh, when they arrested Jesus, and he reached out and said, permit me this. And he reached out and healed the servants, the high priest servants here. But in this little picture that the person sent me, he's reaching out to touch him. He goes, happy new ear. So we, you know, it just kind of hit me like, we need to hear with new ears as we see with new eyes. Ears to hear, eyes to see, you know, our hearts to hold and so we're here and uh, uh, it's been a chilly day so we got chilly for everybody and that's all we're going to say here for right now and so uh, in a little bit Mark if you'd love to lead, lead us into a prayer would that be great yeah. and then uh, we're going to go back here and then y'all come and uh, grab we've got uh, regular chili kind of regular chili I do good homemade chili so yeah, regular chili we got something called posola if you don't know what that is it's pork and white hominy. Actually, I got white and blue hominy in this, uh, and pork, and uh, just got onions and garlic and oregano in it. And all these goodies here are to doctor up the soup and chili any way you want. There's cheese and everything on there. So, you know, you just want to glorify God, you can even glorify Him with a bowl of chili. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you ready to pray in dinner? Yeah, let's do that. Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you so much for the way that you guard over us, protect us, and even discipline us, Lord. You're such a good Father. Oh. Uh, God, show us your way and your will. And uh, go, Lord, I, I ask that you grant us wisdom to understand it. Make it plain and clear. and uh, Give us the discernment that you always said we, we could have in your word. We just want to, we just want to ask for it, Lord. Uh, God, bless this food. Uh, Lord, help this somehow glorify you. Uh, in an abundant way, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, well, hey, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to our first Remnant meeting of 2024. So, I just kind of want to share with you a little bit. As I was driving here, um, as every single time, I'm not really sure why, I always get a little nervous. Um, and it's not just this location, because at first I thought, well, oh, I... That, when I was a principal here, I also had that. I always kind of got nervous because there was always so much trouble. <laughs> but it's not here, it's anytime we do this, whether it be in Montana or Oregon or California or Arizona or Missouri. I always get a little nervous and I was trying to think, what is that? Like why? That makes no sense. And what I believe it is, is that I just have a deep longing to 
not misstep, to do the things of God, to not drop a ball, to not, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of that is because most of the time I'm not really sure what these next steps are. And I'm growing more comfortable with figuring out what that is or being okay with that. But there are some things that I am certain of. I am certain that we are to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, take care of the widows, orphans, visit the prisoners, sick. I am certain of that. I am certain that we are to raise up disciples. I'm certain of that. I am certain that as I'm not really sure what word to use here. I guess I won't use the word church. I'm just going to use the word remnant as the remnant that were to be more like the book of Acts than what we see with our eyes everywhere else. And that's really the part that's been hard for me as I stare at things. You know, I've been involved in my lifetime. I've been to a lot of churches, but been involved. Like, I'm digging in. I'm wanting to get to know people. I'm digging into the ministry. I'm doing that sort of thing. <coughs> Those particular times that I engaged in it, my experience... And again, these are just the ones I dug into. The first church I was heavily involved in when I first became a Christian, I was like, well, then what do you do when you first become a Christian? You go to church. Was more, it was a dying church. It was a dying, there were 12 of us. Um, and all of them were much older than I was. Uh, but I stayed for years because it's where God put me in. And as I left there, I was going through some things, and I realized that not only did I not, not only did, was there anything there that could help me through those things, but I didn't really want their help if there was. Uh, it was just a reality I came to in my own head. And then the next church I got involved in heavily uh, was. <coughs> a verse-by-verse preaching church. Uh, they would preach the word, you know, like, so they didn't just sit there and go, okay, today we're going to talk about John chapter 8, verse 17. They were going to talk about John chapter 8, verse 17. They would start at John, verse 1-1, one, one, and maybe in about eight months they'd get to eight eighteen, And then eventually they'd finish the whole book in about a year or so. But my goodness, it just... My, the knowledge that, that came from that. I've never seen anything like that as far as teaching the Word of God. That was the first time I was ever exposed to that kind of thing. And the things I realized from that church were two things. Number one was that to really understand what it is God was trying to tell a prophet or try, trying to tell Moses in writing the first books of the Bible or trying to tell uh, the disciples, anything that Jesus was maybe trying to tell somebody, it's important you understand the whole context. It's incredibly important. There are so many things that the church today are practicing simply because they'll grab a verse and they'll just say, okay, well, here's what this says. But in reality, it doesn't say that. If you look at the context, because they're not actually talking about the thing you're trying to place that on. But the problem that I had with that particular place was their, the teaching was outstanding, but the doing didn't really exist. Uh, there was no doing to do. Uh, that was that same group that I'd shared. It was in a men's group and at that church. And we meet this uh, one of the church leaders in the basement of his house. There's like 18 men and we meet down there. And we started going through the book of Acts, and it was about six months in, I thought, you know, like, we were doing this for half a year. There are no Acts. Like, we're talking about it, and we're learning a lot of great things, but we're not actually acting. The next church I was involved in was a giant megachurch. Um, I don't know what drew me to that. 
maybe the same thing that drew my children to it. It was just so darn entertaining. Um, as I looked at it, I thought, what was it? Like, but the, the things we would talk about there would be like all of a sudden there'd be this, we do a unit on the family or something. We'd talk about family stuff for about a month and a half. What I started to realize was a couple things. One, all those units we'd go through are purchased. You know, they're, not, they're not brought by the Holy Spirit. They're not brought by the living Word of God. They're brought by the man. And the very last time I attended that church, what I knew it at the time was they're on a $20 million a year budget. 85% went to salary. Um, somebody's making a lot of money. And it's mostly a bunch of men. Just a handful of men, 20, 30 men. And there again, there was no doing. Like we talked about a lot of things, but there was no actual doing. And it, the show became so incredibly important that they started moving into things like $25,000 guitars, um, $5 million in audio and smoke machines and lights. And the very last time I stepped foot in that building is the Christmas service. And it, it reminded me of the Donnie Marie Osmond Christmas specials they did in the 70s and 80s. It was just a big, la, la, la. Um, and what got me was there was the, all these toy soldiers that came out. It's been like 20 of them. And I, in my head, I thought, those costumes got to cost at least $1,000 each. Uh, those are good costumes. They were good. Really good. It was a great show. But as I left there, I thought, I don't even know what I watched. Like, did they say Jesus? Um, but it was cheered and jeered, and that, that church continued to grow and thrive. But that still did not really bother me. It's just not my thing. Uh, what really started to bother me was when I was standing here as the leader of the school and I, I we were deep in debt when I walked in um, about a hundred thousand dollars short a year you know it's hard to conjure up a thousand hundred thousand dollars and I, I as I did the budget I did it like 500 different ways and I sat there and I literally was in my office by myself and I said out loud this is But I knew, but you know, not with God. And God was like, that's right. <laughs> now you get it, Mark. So I went to the school board and I said, I believe we should talk to all the local churches. There's two things we'll get out of this. Number one, God says in his word, bring your tithes and offering into my storehouse and I will open up the window of heaven and pour out such a blessing that there's not enough room to hold it all. And I will rebuke the devourer on you for your sake. I want in on that. If I'm going to be a part of this school, we have to rebuke the devourer because the devourer had control of this building. And we can't do it ourselves financially. Um, I grew up in poverty. I've never been good at money. So the other part was, was it gave an opportunity to go out and you get to meet the pastors of the county. So I literally went out. You know, once the school board, they agreed. That was beautiful. They agreed. It's hard to tell somebody, hey, we're $100,000 short. I suggest we give away $30,000. But they agreed because their hearts were in the right place. And I went out and I started meeting pastors in this county. Maybe every single one of them. And I would tell them, here's what we're doing. And they do two things every single time. They look at me and say something to the effect of, you're crazy. <laughs> or, which was only a few, would say, that is the right thing to do. And so I did. And I started little. You know, we'll give that church 300 bucks, that church. Just kind of give everybody 300 bucks. See what happens. You know, just kind of. And it's something about when you hand somebody money, it changes the relationship dramatically. <laughs> dramatically. And as years went by, years went by, I became close with many of these pastors personally. We'd have lunch, go out to dinner, their wives and me, my wife. 
And I remember occasionally thinking, all right, I'm in some trouble. And I know some of these pastors are more friends now. And I'd say, hey, we could really lean on you right now if you can help out. And the answer was 100% of the time, oh, we just don't have it. Well, maybe next year when you do your budget, you can include us. Oh, yeah, yeah. We were never included in a budget. The only churches around here, I'm not going to tell you the ones that do not help out the ministries, because it wasn't just me. I understand why I want to help that ministry. We already helped this ministry or that ministry or that ministry. But the other people I got to know were the ministry leaders around here. And it was a very similar thing. Uh, nobody was helping them either. And more so, what I saw was some of the pastors were actually trying to take advantage of the ministries. Uh, trying to somehow profit off of the local ministries. Um, now, I don't want to say all, because many, many did wonderful things. Uh, for example, Cowboy Church, I'm just going to call them by name, here in Johnson County, always helped when we didn't ask. They just saw it. God would tell, like, he'd just show up and say, God told me to give you money. And we're like, oh my God, we needed it today. How did you know? Um, and then Friendship Church down the road, they're a very small church, but they'd send like 26 bucks every month, every single month. But it just showed... I remember a little girl came in and she gave me a little pile of pennies and I left that pile of pennies on my desk the entire time I was here because that had more meaning than what any of the churches around here were doing except for the two I mentioned and a handful of others. Now that was the point whenever I said, you know what, I can't do this anymore. I love my father. I love him. I know <clears throat> what he did for me and nobody else in this world is willing to do that for me. I've had a lot of people who looked me in the eyes and said, I love you. I will never do this thing to you. And then they do that thing to you. Or they'd say, I love you. I will always be there for you. Unless it costs them something. But not my father. He's always there for me. And not only is he always there for you, he's willing to give the ultimate cost. He's willing to lay down his life for me. So I grew angry. It was a righteous anger grew in me. How dare you take the sacrifice of the altar and consume it? There was a guy in the Bible. I'm going to find this story sometime and read it here. But a man, a high priest, his children were consuming the sacrifice of the altar. There's a lot of value in the sacrifice of the altar. Somebody give their prize bulls. Because people bring their prize to the temple. They don't bring their lame lambs. And when they did, obviously God had a problem with that. They bring the best. Because that's what God wants. So there's a lot of value in that meat alone. So they would consume it. They'd literally eat it. Or they'd sell it. And they'd make money off it. And God warned them and warned them and warned them and warned them. And eventually, he turned them in, he turned the father inside. He said, I'm going to turn you inside out. He did. That's how he died. All his insides came out. God is not okay with consuming the sacrifice of the altar. He is not okay with it. It is a wicked, wicked thing to do. The sacrifice of the altar, when it was a blood sacrifice, was a direct representation of Jesus Christ. He is not okay with that. No matter how much you think your budget fits or how much any of that fits, he is not okay with it. So I reached out to people. I said, you know, on my channel, I was like, hey, here's how I feel. I can't do this anymore. I can't play church anymore. I'm not interested in playing church. I don't have time. I have five children. It's an okay show, by the way, but I'm not interested. If I'm going to go to a show, I have a lot of other shows I'd rather see. I just don't have the time and I desire to be about my father's business. So I, I sought it out. Well, who's about my father's business? And it's a hard thing to find. It is a hard thing to find. And as I put that out there, what I got back was thousands of people. Me too. My church in Tennessee. My church in Australia. My church in San Francisco. My church in everywhere in the world. Everywhere in the world. And I thought, well, thank God I'm not alone because I only had three examples. Like, I kind of thought, well, maybe it's just around here. Like, I kind of felt like, am I the only one that gets it? Like, 
Am I? Because sometimes when you think you see something, but the, everybody else around you doesn't see it, you got to you start to go, well, am I? Am I the wrong one? And do I? Do I not see it right? How is it I can see this, but nobody else seems to see it? So to hear that, thousands of people, I just thought, oh my God, the stories they would tell, they're the same stories. I, they're the same stories. All those stories I just shared, I've heard a thousand times over the last several years. So what I'm nervous about is taking that ball and dropping that. Like, what do you do with that ball? So here we are. And, it, and it, the purpose that I that I believe is is so we can number one know each other because we are a scattered people. We are a scattered people. I learned that day one. As soon as I started getting all those emails, I was like, oh, right away, I was like, oh, Jeremiah said this would happen. <laughs> like, he said we'd be a scattered people. The remnant would be scattered, and God desires to unite the remnant in the end times. And I thought, well. Is this what you're asking me to do, God? Is to play whatever little tiny role there is in that? But I didn't know. I, I still don't know a lot of what it is God's asking us to do. But I do know that starting with feed the hungry, clothe the naked, take care of the wisdom of the Lord, visit the prisoners sick, raise up disciples. I know this to be so. But as I go through the book of Acts, every time I read it, I think, well, we don't do that. We don't do that. We don't do that. We don't do that. I just, every every sentence, I'm like, well, we don't do that. We don't do that. We don't do that. Over and over again. And the book of Acts has really been a great compass for me. Um, I pray it is for you as well. Because it is literally the only, not a example of the church. It is the only real example of the church. I've never heard of. I've never heard of. I don't know if there was another church like this when all these people first, when that first generation passed away. Well, not when that first generation passed away. When that first generation was martyred and killed and imprisoned. And somehow we as a church think, well, none of that hard stuff was ever meant for us. But yet here Jesus went through the worst of the worst. The disciples, all of them were imprisoned and killed. You know, only John, was it John? Who wrote? Yeah. John, okay, so only John is the one who lived, but but they tried to kill him. <laughs> he just, God brought him back. So they put him, you know, so he can then write the book of Revelation. So I think it's incredibly important that we look at the book of Acts. You know, it may be 10 years before we can get to the end of this book of Acts, but it's incredibly important we do our best to follow the guidance in it because God is not the God of confusion. He makes it plain and clear what it is we are to be doing. And the very last thing we talked about was when Peter and John go to the gates of the temple and a man who was lame from his mother's womb was sitting there taking alms. And they boldly walk up to him and they say, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise and walk. And he took it by the right hand and lifted him up and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Never moved his legs before, but yet here's bones, super muscles supernaturally growing around his bones in a moment. Not like over the years, he slowly got stronger right then and there in that moment. So why don't, why don't we see this? Was kind of, as I read that, I was like, we should be seeing this everywhere we go. Everywhere we go, we should be seeing this because I brought it up last time. The healings I've seen in the church, I'm just going to say that's crazy stuff. I've never seen crazy, you know, like people walking around, touching each other, and they just freak out, fall on the ground. I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is. That's not what this is. But that's it. So we have this example of the cable TV preachers who are liars. And then we have the church that is not really healing anybody. 
Now, I'm not saying there's not healings in the church. It's not like I'm not saying all churches are going the wrong direction. And I, I always have to limit my words from all, every, or never. I'm trying not to, hard to just say this isn't all, it's not never. I just haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. And according to Peter, this is something that it is our fault we don't see it. It is not the power of God that is at fault for a lack of healing in the church. It is our fault. Now, as a lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's Greatly Amazed. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why do you so intently, or why do you look so intently at us? Though by our own power of godliness, we had made this man walk. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One, and just, and ask for a murder to be granted to you, and kill the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. And his name, through faith, and his name, you has made this man strong, whom you see and know. <coughs> yes, the faith which comes through him has given this man, him, this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. What those people did to Jesus Christ is not the same thing we're doing to Jesus Christ, of course, because they literally killed him. <coughs> but they denied him, and they denied the power. And I believe wholeheartedly that is the problem. It is the denial of the power of Jesus Christ that we are not seeing healings. It is this somehow, well, this can't be real. It's denying the power of Jesus Christ, straight up. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did not. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. It, every single thing that the prophet said somehow revolved around the pet, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This entire book, from the beginning of that to the end is about one thing. It's about the advancement of the kingdom of heaven from start to finish, to eternity. Everything that we can witness as humans and beyond. <laughs> and everything that Jesus Christ did as he walked to and fro around this earth performing miracles was always according to the faith of the person receiving the miracle. So I want to take a moment to speak directly to the remnant, whether you're here or I'm watching. We have to stop denying the power of Jesus Christ. We have to accept it for what it is and not deny it. We have to. Accept our ignorance <clears throat> in denying who he is. We have to accept it. It's ignorance. And we've been fed it our whole lives. And we have to stop taking it in and say, well, wait a second, that's not right. Because the things that God foretold about Jesus Christ have already happened. And the things on the second coming are still going to happen, just like the first time. So this denial 
that we have really just feeds into kind of this interim. You know, we are the stewards of the Christian faith until Christ returns. We are. And if we're stewarding in the gathering only, if we're saying, all right, I'm going to steward the Christian faith. All right, we gather. That's it. And I'm not suggesting we forsake the gathering. But it can't just be a gathering. It has to be a mission. It has to be tomorrow and the next day and the next day. It can't just be here in this building. You know, something I shared in a video recently, it's two sayings. I love these sayings. If your ministry does not leave the four walls of this building, you don't have a ministry. So we have to take it beyond. So I prayerfully just, God, what's the next step? What are we to do? Because the certainties go beyond the feed the hungry, clothe the naked, take care of the Lord's orphans, visit the prisoners sick, raise up disciples. God, by his word, desires to unite the remnant. It's about knowing each other. It's about knowing each other and creating these relationships. But healing has to be in there. And, and I, I don't want to deny the power of Jesus Christ in any way, shape, or form. And I definitely don't want to falsify the power of Jesus Christ in any way, shape, or form. But what I do know is when you pray for healing in the name of Jesus Christ and you believe it, then it's real. And it's something we should be seeing a lot more of. And what I do know is that some of us here have some things going on physically. So I, I just like to take a moment and, and suggest that we not play around with that. Uh, that we, we not deny the power of Jesus Christ. So I want to take a moment and just ask everybody to just pray quietly. And then if you need healing of any kind, um, I know somebody was saying their back hurt earlier. I've been very sick to my stomach for weeks. I don't even know what's going on with me. Nauseous every single day. So I want to take a moment. Uh, we're just going to pray quietly. Um, if you need healing, I need healing. If somebody would be willing to pray over me, uh, I believe in it. I am one of those people who will receive it in faith. Jesus always says, your faith that healed you. You were healed by your faith. And I think there's, you know, I think so often as American Christians, you know, we, like you see on Facebook, oh, I'm sick, will somebody pray for me? Oh, yeah, here, thumbs up. We have to get into what this really is. What is this? What is this healing thing? You know, people in Africa are watching legs grow, watching lame men walk, they're watching people rise from the dead because they're not Amen. playing around, they're not playing Amen. church. It's not a game to them. They're not there to be entertained. It's not a show. It's real. It's real. Persecution is real. Tribulation is real. It's real. It's not this thing we escape. It's real. So as we quietly pray, again, I just want you to wholeheartedly, if you're there, I believe your head has to be there. I believe you, you have to know what it is Jesus is offering you. Uh, so take a few seconds, just quietly pray. And then anybody willing to pray for those who are sick, just when you, when you, if you raise your hand, if you want healing, just people dogpile them in love. If I have unforgiveness in my heart, it's like um, a stronghold. 
and the enemy has authority in that stronghold. And the only way that that authority is broken is that I have to forgive. And forgiveness is pretty simple. I think we complicate it. But forgiveness just means to send it away. And so for me, is identifying who's the person who's harmed me and naming the thing they did that harmed me and sending it over to my father and trusting him with it and whatever he wants to do, but it doesn't belong to me anymore. And if I've done sin and I need to be forgiven, it's that simple too. It's identifying what I've done, what is the enemy using, where does he have a foothold? Because he only has a foothold where I allow it. Because Jesus said all authority has been given to him, <coughs> not to anyone else. So if the enemy has authority, it's because I, I've given him permission. So is there something in my life that gives him permission that prevents me from being able to receive what my father has for me? And so in, in my counseling, one of the first things we address is places where people have been harmed or hurt or wronged, and we go through a, a forgiveness exercise that helps them to understand it's really not complicated. The world has complicated it. Um, they often say, well, I don't feel forgiven. And the last time I checked, God told me to walk by faith, not by feelings. And so if I've confessed it and repented, God says, I will forgive you, and I am forgiven. Now walk in it. There's nothing else. I don't have to forgive myself. I'm not waiting for feeling. I'm going to walk by faith. And to do that, it'll grow. But I think we don't receive what he has for us because we have perhaps a stronghold. Sometimes it could be a stronghold of fear. Sometimes it's fear. Um, it's the one command that's in the Bible more than any other command, almost 400 times. Don't be afraid. Well, it's not because there aren't fearful things, but it's because he says, when I'm afraid, I will trust in you. And so he's going to do that. So I, I would check, I check my own heart first to see if there's something that keeps me from being able to receive. And unforgiveness is usually at the top of the list. Amen. Thank you. I always appreciate the wisdom you bring. <laughs> I really do. Um, so if you would, please take a moment. Um, I have things I need to repent of. Um, I have things I need to forgive as well. Uh, so take this time. Do that as well. <clears throat> I mean, interesting as I was sitting there trying to forgive people, I got flooded. I didn't realize I had so many people I needed to forgive. I do not like being the spokesperson. You're doing good. Okay. Thank you. You said something that triggered a thought that we need to be, we need to spend some time praying and seeking all the heart. The scripture actually says that we are to confess our sins to one another and pray for one another that we may be healed. I think maybe that's part of what's wrong with the church, is that we spend so much time looking at ourselves and never going with someone else and, and allowing them to pray and us to pray together. It says the effectual form of prayer of a righteous person accomplishes much. And I heard a pastor one time who said the one thing that we don't do enough of is confess. We need to not just confess wrongs, but we also need to confess you know, praises and things that God's doing. We're supposed to be encouraging one another with songs and hymns and spiritual songs. But when you said that, I thought, probably ought to be finding somebody else that we're confessing to also so that they can join us. Because sometimes the strongholds can't be torn down without assistance. Thank you, Mark. It's always good. It's always good. All right, so maybe what we could do is uh, break up into groups, like at your table. Um, or maybe we can combine these front, two front tables. Um, if there's somebody, you know, just, if, if you need healing at that table, um, or if you need healing, just if you want to confess, if there's something you need to share, 
you know, I'll just share with you that, you know, my, uh, my mother was married to a very wicked man uh, that she married when I was very young, very young, very abusive, uh, physically, mentally, all sorts of other ways that I don't want to speak of. And they just got a divorce like a month ago. You know, I've been dealing with this guy for 40 years. And what it did to all of our siblings is it kind of just, just crashed. It's just everybody started going through high anxiety, uh, the stress, just and everything. All of a sudden, all the siblings are fighting with each other. You realize all this is from our childhood. All of it. Not some of it. All of it. <laughs> and, you know, and here we are. We're not even talking, some of us now, because really just the decisions our parents make, you know. And, uh, there's a lot of repentance necessary in that one. Uh, there's a lot of forgiveness necessary in that one. A lot. Uh, Lord, forgive me. So if you would, please just take it home. If you need prayer or if you need healing prayer, just please raise your hand uh, if you're there. Um, anybody who wants to kind of dogpile in love, 